So as it says, vast majority of Kanban boards, so-called Kanban boards, contain no Kanban, none, not one. So I invented, with a little story that I'll recount, uh, a different style of Kanban board, slightly different style of Kanban board, which I think, um, although subtly different, might actually make quite a difference. Anyone recognize the push pull you animal? Yeah, it's from Dr. Doolittle. The spelling's a little bit different, but I changed it deliberately. So we'll start back to basics. What is Kanban? Uh, fortunately, we have uh, the oracle, Mr. Anderson himself, who wrote this book, obviously, and he can tell us. Is David here, by the way? He's not. Excellent. I can tell you a little known fact about David, that he changed his name many years ago so that his surname began with an A, so that his name would be first on the list of speakers. If you look at the list of speakers, you'll see his name is first. His real name is not actually David Anderson. He says, Kanban is a Japanese word that literally means signal card. The card is used as a signal to tell an upstream step in the process to produce more work. So that's what David says. And so the question is, is that enough to know what a Kanban is? And the answer is no, because a Kanban is a system. An individual Kanban is a system. And from systems thinking, we know that everything is a system and everything is part of a larger system. So if you want to understand what a Kanban is and how a Kanban is supposed to work, you have to ask yourself the question, what is the Kanban system that the Kanban is inside? OK? And this is something that's a well-known fact in systems thinking. Uh, there's an excellent book, two books actually, both related to the uh, fighter pilot John Boyd. If anyone's come across those, I highly recommend them. Really, really excellent books. You cannot determine the character or nature of a system within itself. So we have to look at a Kanban system. Fortunately, David tells us that as well in the same book by basing it on the first principles. He says, the first principles of Kanban, two things. And I remember him speaking at a, co a little conference um, in Oslo many, many years ago. And he said, he said, he actually said, these are the two things that constitute Kanban. And he said, you can quote me on this. So I am. The first one is limiting work in progress, and the second one is pulling rather than pushing. Those are the two things he said that constitute a Kanban system. So let's put up a little straw man, just so that we can immediately realize <coughs> um, why this system here that doesn't have any work in progress limits isn't going to work. Standard setup, working left to right, key on the bottom telling us that a story is in yellow. When a particular story gets to done, we put, the idea is we push it to the right-hand side to the downstream process like that, and it's pushed, OK? So only two things we have to qualify to make a Kanban system. The first one is, are we limiting the work in progress? And the answer is no, and that's fine because it was just a straw man. So what can we do? We can introduce a work in progress limit. No problems at all. And now what we do, more or less, is this. We see the done story here. We're thinking about, can we push that there or not? And it's not our decision in the, the blue wibbling column. The idea is it's the responsibility on the other side. So we count the number of stories in that column. There's one, two, three, four. We see that the top of the column has a four. And so we can do a bit of coding. And we can say the value of that variable, which is a Boolean variable, is the result of that Boolean expression. Does four equal four? And the answer is yes, it does. And therefore, we can't push that piece of work into the right-hand side column there like that. Yeah, so that's, I'm sure you all know, that's just the, the nature of why we have work in progress limits. Yeah, so having done that, we've satisfied the first criteria. We now have work in progress limits. But have we got a pull system? And what's this other bit after that in his book where he says a pull system using visual signaling system? Pull work using a visual signaling system. What's this visual stuff? I think it's important. I think the visual aspect of it is very, very important. Here's a quote from a book that's one of my favorite books by John Medina. Vision is by far our most dominant sense, taking half of our brain's resources. And Don Reinerston says the same thing in a moment. Um, we'll come to that. So let's look at this, and, and I'll try and explain why I was worried by this. Here's the same setup we had as before. <clears throat> Four stories, wibbling column limit five. Four is five, no, so that's false. But here's another column. We'll connect the columns up in a moment. And this one has a limit of three, and there's one, two, three stories. So is, are we at the work in progress limit for this column? The answer is yes, we are. 
OK? So there they are, the two columns together. <clears throat> this one, no, it's not at its limit. This one, yes, it is at its limit. There they are. And they look the same. This bothers me. Yeah, the fact that these two columns, when you just look at them like that, visually, to your first initial impression, they look the same. That bothers me. OK? I want something that's a visual system. Because it says in the definition that we're supposed to have a visual system. So let's recap a minute. What did we do? To limit the work in progress, we added work in progress limits. Seems like a no-brainer. Well, that bothers me too, because these are abstractions. These fives are abstractions. Yeah? And that bothers me, because they're not visual. Yeah? And if we come back a second to something we remember from earlier, yeah, how do you determine the nature of something? You have to consider not just the thing, but the system that it lives within. Yeah? And a silly little example of that is, what happens if you have a headache? Do you prize open your head? No, you don't operate on your head when you have a headache. You take a pill, which goes to your stomach, because you're affecting the larger system. Yeah, that is the natural way of curing a headache. And yet, when we have a problem, we didn't go to the larger system and solve that problem. So the natural effect was that we solved the problem. We just went in with a kind of, to me, brute force and ignorance approach of solving the problem, directly into the head kind of effect. Okay? So I remind you, you cannot determine the nature of a system within itself. And this is one of the reasons why testing is so valuable. Because testing gives you another environment around the thing that you're trying to test. When you have a code and tests that co-evolve in parallel, okay, you have something that is capable of defeating entropy, basically. You have a complex system. And to come back to Don Reinerstein, as I said we would, yeah, in this very influential book about flow, he quotes, he says quite clearly, companies inevitably feel they can computerize whiteboards. They almost always create more elegant but less useful systems. And I think we've abstracted away a lot of the visualness. So that's why I decided to think about that and try and come up with an alternative. And it didn't take me quite long once I had these insights, to be, to be honest, because we have to come back to the, the, whip, the whip limits again. Those just felt wrong to me. Now, it might be that I'm just crazy, but to me, they felt wrong. So we're going to just move the stories out of the columns just for a moment. There they go. And we're going to look at these whip limits. So if the whip limit on the wibbling column the blue wibbling column is five. We're going to add five Kanban. One, two, three, four, five. And then we do the same thing on the other side. The work in progress limit for the red foobarring column is three. So we put one Kanban, two Kanban, three Kanban. And hopefully you can see now that the work in progress limits, which are abstractions of what we actually have visually in place now, we don't need those, so we can get rid of them. Now, we have to introduce a rule. We only actually need two rules, depending on whether we're actually going to use allow push or not. But the first rule is limiting. Every story must always be in its own Kanban. Otherwise, it doesn't work. So if we visualize that, we can see that this story is in a red Kanban from the red team. This story is in a blue Kanban from the blue team. But this one isn't in a, in a Kanban. So that story is forbidden. You're not allowed to have that on the diagram. And so what we simply do is put the stories back into the Kanbans, like that, and that's it. Everything follows from that, OK? But I'm going to step it through to try and explain what I mean carefully. So let's, revi let's revise, revisit these ideas. Two first principles, are we limiting the work in progress? The answer is yes, we are, because a story must always be in a Kanban, all right? If we wanted to add some more work into this column here, we can't unless we have another red Kanban. Yeah? So we have a direct visual manipulation system that we can add a red Kanban here to represent the idea of increasing the capacity. Similarly, we have a spare Kanban here indicating that there is some spare capacity in the system. But if we wanted to, we could remove that Kanban yeah, to try and perhaps in increase the flow rate. We definitely have work in progress limits. And we also have a proper pull system using a visual signaling. So let's look at pulling. Pretty straightforward. And in fact, because we use this idea of finding out the definition of something based on the system that is inside, we've already done the work, in fact, because we revisit this definition. We can see that a Kanban, and, and it's interesting that the word Kanban is sometimes being used in the sense of a noun, 
Kanban here in the sense of a noun. But sometimes Kanban is being used in the sense of the whole system. When you read the book, you have to be quite careful about that. But that's the way English works, OK? Uh, the card is used. The card, the Kanban card, is used as a signal. You actually send the card to signal to the upstream process to say, produce more work. So this gives us our obvious second rule. If you want to actually pull, properly pull, you simply send an empty Kanban to the upstream process. So as we said, the red column has a spare Kanban. So that's what we're focusing on. They can simply send that to the upstream column to indicate they would like some more work, please. And there it goes. At some point, some piece of work in the upstream process finishes. It's done, in which case it can move into the empty Kanban like that and go back where it came from. That's pull. It's a visual system. It's completely obvious. And we start to see flow now. We really start to see flow. But by the virtue of this story moving down into the red Kanban and going back over to here, obviously this blue Kanban is now empty. And so this Kanban can be used as a signal to its upstream process to indicate that the blue column, the wibbling column, would like to do more work. Maybe. Maybe they just keep it with themselves for a while. They can choose to regulate the flow of control, right? They send it upstream. Obviously, downstream from the red column, there's another team working away. Maybe they send a pull signal to the red column to say, we'd like to do some work there. Yeah, there it goes. And the red column, the red team works, works and works and works. Eventually, one of their stories is done. They can transfer it to the empty green Kanban. There it goes, back to where it came from. Okay? And now the red team has freed up one of their Kanban. So the red Kanban can be signaled back the way it was just a moment ago to the blue team, like that. And the green team, once again, has an empty Kanban that they can push back again. And we have a proper flow system. Yeah? We have things moving from the left, start again, from the right to the left. Yeah? That's what happens when there's a pull. If things move from the left to the right, you've got a push system. Okay? And so I claim that based on this, we have a proper visual pull system. And the vast majority of Kanban balls that I see have work in progress limits, but they don't have pull and they're not visual. But those two things are really the same thing. Now, there's some other things that bother me. I sort of learned as I get older that when you've got a sort of knot in your stomach, that's often a much better indicator of whether something's right or wrong than the logic in your mind. So in my gut, things didn't quite feel right. And it took a while before I could actually figure out what they were and verbalize it. But I've tried to do the best I can. And again, I thank David for the opportunity to sort of the impetus to put these thoughts into slides so that I can talk about this. Again, this is a sort of halfway hybrid system, uh, a board, where some of the stories are in progress and some of them aren't. Some of them are done. Just the one that's done in this case and four of them are in progress. Now, it bothers me that, again, they look too similar. I want a visual system so that stuff that's done is clearly visually distinct from stuff that's still in progress. Yeah? It's the stuff that's in progress that's fine. Don't need to worry about that too much. It's the stuff that's done but is waiting. That's the thing that actually hurts your flow. And of course, we know this, so that was a bit of a straw man. Most of the time, if you see an actual classical style Kanban board, it's split into two, and we have in progress on the left and done on the right, precisely so we can try and recapture this idea of what's done. So when something becomes, a story becomes done, in the left-hand side of this blue column, it transfers to the right. That's a push. Stuff going from the left to the right is a push, right? It, st it stays there, yeah, until there's a free capacity on the right-hand side, at which point it then goes the, to the right-hand side again as a push. This is pushing. Okay? But the point is, if you wanted to go further beyond just a regular Kanban system based on two, David's two criteria, you could actually use the same system I'm describing here, the, the, the push-me-pull you system, because if an empty Kanban going in that direction signifies a pull, then logically, a full Kanban going in the other direction signifies a push. And so it is, OK? So when this particular piece of work gets done, we don't have to transfer it to the right-hand side of this column. We can just send the whole piece of work and its Kanban into the other column. 
Okay? The fact that they different, have different colors, the Kanbans have different colors in the different columns, is perfectly adequate to, to make it visually clear that this piece of work is done, whereas these ones are in progress, yeah? because the red ones are in a red column. Now, maybe there's a, there's a spare red Kanban in the red column. Maybe there isn't, okay? But sooner or later, hopefully, there is, in which case this piece of work can be transferred onto the empty Kanban because a, piece of, a story must always be in a Kanban, okay? We can't just take that one out of there, put it down here, and let the blue Kanban come back to here. A, a story must always be in a, col in a Kanban. So we transfer it across, and then the blue Kanban can come back again, okay? So we have a system that allows work in progress limits, it allows push and it allows pull. You may not want to do push, but it allows it. And again, just to explore some of the ideas in my mind about this, I, uh, I just put together a few potential patterns. So does it work or not? Let's see, you tell me. What does this signify? <laughs> right, yeah. This team is obviously working faster than this team because they're sending requests for work, but this team aren't finishing their work enough to empty their Kanban so that they can satisfy those requests. What about this one? The red team is still the bottleneck, but we're seeing it slightly differently because it's the blue team now that's sending the, work, the finished work down to the red team. But again, the red team doesn't have any spare Kanban yet to actually pull those pieces of work and free the blue Kanban so the blue Kanban can come back again. It's completely obvious. And of course, it's likely that these are going to happen in combination. So we have this kind of setup. Yeah? Now, I, lo I, I think this has something going for it. Because on a classical Kanban board, if we were, the blue team was working faster than the red team, OK, the blue team would have all of its, camp its pieces of work, its stories, collecting up here. Right? on the right-hand side. But that's not where the problem is, OK? The problem is the combination of the red team and the blue team. It's not the blue team. It's not the red team. It's the relationship between the red team and the blue team. They're not working at the same rate, OK? And this, I think, again, v clearly visualizes that because we have blue things in the red column, indicating it's the nature of the relationship, OK? Now, of course, once this happens, this might get a bit awkward to actually see. It goes starts to go beyond the length of the board, so we can shuffle things back up like that. And now it sort of feels like it did before when we move it to the right-hand side of the left column over here, and obviously, logically, this becomes the right-hand side from the other side, yeah? Crazy ideas beyond that. Once we've done that, the blue having a blue title and the red having a red title and the green having a green title means... Oh, I forgot. Oh, I added some extra slides. <laughs> Always a danger if you add an extra slide. Come back to that in a minute. Again, visualization, this gives you a very clear indication of visualization of just in time, when you, do, when you want something to work in just in time. Because if this piece of work here in the upstream process finishes at the same time that a Kanban becomes free in the downstream process, then just in time means that they'll both send their signal. The red signal will come as a pull request from downstream, and the full Kanban with its story inside it will come as a push from the upstream, and they'll meet in the middle because they were just in time, yeah? That's a representation of the fact that stuff is waiting for the minimum amount of time, which is what just in time is all about. We also get a visualization of Slack. I think Slack is tremendously important. Again, if you look at Don Reinerston's book, he says, uh, if you have a system at 95% capacity, okay, that system has, I think it's, I'm pretty sure it's 25 times the variance of a system that is at 75% capacity, yeah? If you've got too much work in the system, you're just killing the system. Think about, you know, cars on a, net, on a, on a motorway. We know this instinctively, okay? But it's, unless it's visual, it's very hard to see that. So here's 100% utilization. How much of the time is the board like this? That amount of time is the time you're at 100% utilization. Everyone's working all the time. Because these are in progress, right? These are in progress. This is 75% utilization. Because some of the time, this Kanban is empty. It might not be here. It might be over here, yeah, waiting to be filled up. But the fact that it's empty is the fact that this is not an overloaded part of the system, OK? 
Okay, here's the one I thought uh, I was going to talk about a minute ago. We can move the titles of the columns down to the bottom, and if we wanted to, because of the color coding, we can even move them outside. And then rather than doing them left to right, we can actually line them up like that. And when I did that, I realized instinctively I was still writing the names of the columns in a push fashion. Yeah? The blue one is on the left, the red one is in, underneath, and the green one is at the bottom. I'm still implicitly thinking things are push. Yeah? And if we want to really get to this idea of pull and, and have a representation of the whole system, because that's what pull is about, connecting up the left-hand side to the, and the right-hand side so that it's one system that's connected, then why not just reverse these? Yeah, play around, see what happens. Last observation. These are the stories in a backlog. They always appear on the left-hand side. We work those through the system in a push fashion. And we end up, over on the right-hand side, delivering them to our customer. Right? Well, it, it, that, just for a moment, that struck me as odd, because these are user stories, right? I don't like the word user. It kind of makes me think of a druggie. Yeah? But the, I call these customer stories. If these are customer stories and this is your customer, why are the customer stories on the left but the customers on the right? Yeah? Why don't we have the customer and the customer stories in the same place, either on the left or on the right? That was a thought that went through my mind. And then I thought, well, why not? Rearrange these like this. So there's the same columns, right? But now we've got a circular flow. Yeah, and here's the stories from the customer. This feels like a sort of more connected system. Never seen anyone do it. These are all just crazy ideas. Don't know whether it's got any miles, any legs at all. Something else struck me when I put this one up. What about the corners? <laughs> Think of a Monopoly board. One of the corners on a Monopoly board is actually free parking. And you kind of are parking, aren't you? Because if you arrange it like this, then when a piece of work is stuck here in its Kanban, that's kind of, again, the idea that it's waiting. It's not being worked on here, and it's not being worked on here. It's it represents the fact that there's no flow between this side and this side. Again, we can measure how much stuff is in the corners. That's all I have to say. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs>